formal. Well, well, thanks everybody for showing up, coming, and and uh, spending a little time with us. So I guess we can, you know, we can leave this fairly loose and open, and I can certainly answer questions. But to give you a little bit of background, uh, Paradigm was formed 33 years ago now, and we're based just outside of Toronto. And uh, we probably it was started by three guys, three guys that were buddies, and you know they had the illusion that, gosh, if we had a speaker company, we'd probably get girls, and you know that didn't really work out, I guess. But they did get married. But um, anyway, so um, they started off like most companies, you know, well-intentioned, pretty sharp guys, interested in music, interested in speakers, and they had the really good fortune to um, latch on to this research that got done in Canada. So the Canadian government funded a thing called the National Research Council. And the National Research Council was basically an economic development program. There were lots of different industries that benefited by different NRC research. Speaker industry was one of them. So like all governments, they think, well, gosh, we need more revenue. How do we get more revenue? Well, we get more revenue from taxes. How do we get that? Well, if the Canadian speaker companies were more successful, they would pay more taxes, hire you know, more people, and that would be a great thing. So they funded this whole thing, and the whole idea was, and this was you know, 33 years ago, and you know, obviously people have been making speakers for an awful long time, mostly guys that were really sharp, well-intentioned guys, good idea, that typically latched on to something, right? So if you got Paul Clips, you got like horns, that's the key. You know, if you've got Gail Saunders and uh, uh, Gail and Ron Sutherland, Martin Logan, right? Electrostats are the key. Or, you know, you've got the guys at Quad back in the day. You got all these guys that had different things. Oh, Amar Bose, can't forget him, right? Bouncing things off the wall must be a key. So everybody has these ideas and, and they go on to develop something. With the NRC research, that was the first time that there was ever research into why do people choose the speakers they choose? How can we, as a government, they figured, how can we give these people guidelines to make speakers that more people will like? So they did thousands and thousands of blind listening tests, meaning, we call them double blind, meaning the person doing the test and the people taking the test, neither of them know what they're listening to or what they're switching. So they had a grading system and they got responses and they started correlating this. And it boiled down to really three basic things. And then we added a couple of things in our development that we've stuck with all over these years. So the most basic thing is probably the one thing that if anyone was, came over to your, you guys' houses, right, and they said, well, so what's the number one thing? What's the key? How do you tell a good speaker from a bad speaker? What's the cut to the chase easiest part? You'd say, well, it's the mid-range. It's the voice. That's the one thing we're all experts on. We all know what voices sound like. The mid-range covers the most sound. Our ears are most sensitive there. You know, we're humans and we're always constantly recalibrating ourselves. So we all know what voices sound like. And it's not that that's the only thing, but that's the easiest thing. If you get that right, you're pretty much there. If you don't get that right, you got no hope of getting there. So that's what came out of this study. That, that wide dispersion and even what they call sound power in the room. In other words, you can move about the room and the basic overall sound doesn't change much. It's not like a pinpoint, it's good here and it's bad everywhere else. Um, and then overall distortion. Distortion being change and something's not correct. So it might sound simple, but this has never been done before. This was 30 something years ago, um, right after we got going. So then um, we started taking that and we said, okay, well, there's a couple other things we need, and one of them is full bass response. Because all things being equal, if you have two speakers, most people will say, yeah, that one's fuller, that one's got more body, that one's got more oomph. However they say it, they tend to gravitate to that toward the one that seems thinner. And then the other thing was just basic business, higher power handling. We wanted stuff that was more rugged, more robust, that would hold up well, that would be, you know, stout. And every once in a while, you know, People do kind of nutty things. They have a friend come over and they want to play something loud or you've had a couple more beers that you probably should have on Friday night and you think, oh man, I haven't heard that in a while and you pull out that, you know, 
uh, James Taylor or something, or probably not James Taylor, or like Neil Young. Let's say Neil Young. Let's go with Neil Young in this. Anyway, you crank it up, right? And you know, sometimes you get a little carried away. So we want them to be robust and, and rugged so that they, they hang in there real well. The other really cool thing that came out of that research after that project was over, or kind of the end part of that project, was another project latched onto that called the Athena Project. That part of the NRC research didn't look at speakers, it looked at rooms. So what should a room sound like and how do people perceive the sound? And the cut to the chase there was there's been all kinds of um, attempts over time of people trying to fix rooms, whether it's physical stuff or the size and the shape of the rooms, all that has bearings, of course, the furnishings. But um, there was a, been a lot where a lot of times people would try to do things with equalization, and a lot of times the goal would be to make this flat, a flat response. And so what the study showed was people don't want that in a room. People want a room to sound like a room. So imagine you're in a, an old church downtown, right? And it's, it's one of those cool old churches, and it's got a floor that's like a stone floor, and you're walking across the floor, you expect it to sound like that. If you're walking across there, that stone floor, and it sounds like you're on shag carpet, your brain would go, well, something's not right here. So part of getting that sound right in the room is what's called room gain. And room gain simply means there's a bit of a rise in the low frequency response in a room. There is just that effect. If I'm here and I move back here, right, you can hear the effects of the, the room on my voice. So, you know, too much of anything is not good and, and too little is not good, but the room needs to sound like a room. So, one of the key things we developed over time was called anthem room correction. It was a way of trying to electronically negate the problems the room causes. And I was saying earlier when we were talking um, that everything in, in audio and video ultimately is damage control. We truly never really make something better with better gear or better speakers. We screw it up less, right? No matter how good we do, no matter how good the speakers and how good the room and how good the electronics and how good the cables and how good the positioning and how good we do everything, you can only kind of suspend belief for a little bit. It's never truly going to be the same as having somebody show up sitting there in your room playing the guitar. We try to get closer to it, but we never really quite get that. But the biggest thing we've always struggled with is the room. So much so that back in the day, um, you know, you go back far enough, there wasn't even much of an attempt to fix it. Or you would do physical things as much as you could, like try to figure out the ratios of the room if you were building room. Or, you know, I need to have some hard surfaces and some soft surfaces, and how do I do these things? And how do I not make it like a bathroom, but not make it like an anechoic chamber in a totally dead room? Because both of those obviously are wrong, and, and we've all been in those kind of rooms that are, that are wrong. So that's a lot of what we've done over time, and we just essentially build on those two basic things. The room correction has gotten better over time, and our understanding of how to develop speakers that follow those same parameters has stayed the same, and we've just gotten better at doing it over time. And one of the things we do that's really quite different than most companies is we're what's called vertically integrated, meaning we don't just buy cabinets and then buy parts and put them in the cabinets and wire them up. We make the parts and we make the cabinets and we do the engineering behind this. So we have a really large, it's a quarter million square foot facility up outside of Toronto, right by the airport. And we also have another facility that's up north um, that we call PARC, the Paradigm Advanced Research Center, where we have a lot of engineers who do the DSP stuff and the room correction stuff and the amplifier designs and most of our mechanical engineers are up there. At the production facility, we have our acoustic guys, most of the acoustic engineers and production engineers. So we do a lot of the engineering in two different places and we engineer all our products, but we also, getting back to the manufacturing, we make parts. And we not only make parts, but we make the parts that make up the parts. Like we wind our own voice coils. If you're gonna buy a voice coil out on the market as a manufacturer, 
typically, to buy a good one, an expensive one, the tolerance is plus or minus two terms, one and a half to two terms. Well, when you're making your own, you can say, no, the tolerance is nothing. It has to be right. If it's supposed to be 47 turns on this thing, 47 turns. You make them all 47 turns. So we buy the parts to, like, we don't make wire, but we buy the wire. We buy a very specific wire. Um, we make things like the voice coils. We make things like the baskets for some of the speakers. We make um, cones on our plastic cone speakers. We injection mold those. We do over molding of the surrounds on most of our speakers. Instead of gluing it on there, we put the speaker part, the cone, in a mold and we injection mold the surround over it. So there's no glue that's going to harden and cure and change over time or add extra weight or mass. It's very uniform, but it's very consistent over time and piece to piece. But we also make the parts that make the parts that make up the parts that go into the speakers. We make the tools. So there's giant, you know, when you're going to mold something, you've got these big, giant billets of aluminum, and we carve out the billets of aluminum. I can't remember the machine, but it's a very cool machine that does it with electricity. And so it, it carves out these things with like, it's like an, kind of like an arc welder is what it sort of looks like. It carves out these big chunks of aluminum and we make the male, female halves of this big mold. So we also have really cool machines like a box folding machine. So some of our square speakers, like some of the subwoofers, um, we have B-groove cut into it. Um, the machining is so accurate, for example, on the, the big CNC machines, cutting machines, that it cuts down, like for example, a an inex a fairly inexpensive speaker we would have would be like the monitor series subs. So it would be a subwoofer from about 850 up to about 1100 bucks. And that comes in black vinyl only. So we buy the sheets of the MDF, a specific MDF made in Canada, with black vinyl on it. The cutting tools are so accurate, they cut a groove down to it all the way to the vinyl without cutting the vinyl. It it's like, to me, truly amazing. I've seen it. Yeah, right. I mean, when you can cut down through the wood to the vinyl, you know, I don't know how thick that vinyl is. It's not real thick, but it's it's that accurate. Then it goes in this box folding machine. This wild thing has these little suction cup arms that come out and these things that put glue in there and it folds it up and comes out of the box. So it's it's pretty great, pretty uh, pretty cool facility. We also have uh, North America, and I believe the speaker industry's largest anechoic chamber up there. So we do a lot of testing that way and we have our own testing software for that. So we measure a speaker in the anechoic chamber. The anechoic chamber, by the way, is about half the size of this whole building, square foot-wise, um, that, that we're in. It's big enough that if you took all the wedges out, you could put a small bungalow house in there. I mean, it's truly a huge place. An, an anechoic chamber, of course, I should have said what that is. So an anechoic chamber is a room that you can measure things in with no echoes. It's an anti-echoic, anechoic means anti-echo, no echo. So basically it's a room with big seven foot fiberglass wedges on all surfaces and you walk out on this metal grate and the speakers are on this rotating thing that measures them in this axis and then you lay it down and it measures it in the other axis. So you've got a complete picture of what the speaker looks like. We have the software for it and then of course we either borrow or buy other company speakers because that's sort of our thing. We always want to know what are other people doing, who are our competitors, and how do we beat them? How do we get more sales? I mean, ultimately, it, it's a curious business to be in because it's a hobby and a business at the same time. You know, many of us in this have been in this for a long time on the hobby side, but then also on the business side. So the business part of it is kind of simple in a way. Our goal is just to make speakers that appeal to the widest range of people. And mostly, um, we have a kind of a simple philosophy about doing that. A lot of companies, and, and, and I will say, let me back up a second, I will say this is our philosophy, and I don't think it's inherently other people have a bad philosophy or a wrong philosophy. This is just how we do it. But there's other companies that strive for a very particular sound and they want their speakers to sound like a particular thing. If it's model, you know, this, this brand, they all should have a family sound. Um, same with amplifier companies or electronics companies. Very often there's a goal to have a very particular sound and, you know, that's what they strive for. We strive to get out of the way. So, come on in, come on in.
You're good. Don't worry about me. I want. I was just making stuff. Up. Anyway, yeah. There you go. All right. Thank you. Be comfortable. Have a beer. Have a beer. Hang on to that. <laughs> Where was it? Where was it? So, so that's just how we do it. So, so our goal is just to have less of its own sound. The speakers get out of the way better. Um, it gives us a kind of a clear goal, a pretty simple goal, and we keep trying to get better and you know do less harm, I suppose, if you would say it that way, or or to have less of our own sound. So whether it's an amplifier or a speaker or not, and you know on the hobby side, you may prefer a certain thing. You know, you may say, well, gosh. I like a warm sounding amp, or well, I like a really fast sounding amp, or any of those things, it's all fine, right? It's, this is not life and death, this is fun stuff, is why we do this. But on our side, we think the goal um, is simpler to have a clear goal when you say, I want to get out of the way, I want to try to be the truest line to the source of anything in this price range. Um, so that's, that's just how we approach it. What else? What else should I say? What am I missing? Or which parts haven't I? That so good. As far as there's been a lot of speakers over time that we've made. A lot. I mean, thirty something years, right? There's lots and lots of models, um, and some of the things that that we're really pretty proud of are some of the uh, some of the inventions that we've we've come up with. So some of it has to do with motor systems on um, drivers, the, the magnets and the voice coil that hold motor on the back. Um, sometimes it has to do with one of our really coolest things that we came up with a while ago, and all kinds of speaker companies worldwide, whether they're individual speaker companies or driver manufacturers, have tried to buy this technology from us, um, has been what we call ART, the active ridge technology for the speakers. So like the speakers in here, when you see them, and I'll show you a picture of some new products that are coming, you'll see it on there. The ART surround is a really, really neat thing. And, you know, it's kind of funny when you're making basically moving coil speakers, cone and dome type speakers, you would sort of think, really, how much better can it get? How can they improve on this? There have been speakers like this for a long, long time. And, and I tell you the truth, every time we come out with something, you know, I'll listen to it and I'll think, man, I hope it's better than the last one. I mean, it really needs to be, and the guys are telling me it is, but, you know, you always kind of go in there and like, I wonder if it is. And they always show it to us in a blind listening situation. So we have rooms in the factory where they, all, they still do blind listening tests. The engineers even do that. Um, we have other people come in and do that, but we check it. So when the sales guys go up, they always have cool stuff to show us, but they never tell us what they're playing. So it's always behind a screen, and you know they level match it and do all this stuff. But we go in and they play stuff, and typically there's a bunch of different music on, and you know they let us just flip through and one, two, three. Usually there's three, sometimes four speakers that we're comparing at a time, and it's it's always a blast because you know. You know, you're always a bit nervous. It's like, oh crap! I, I hope I don't pick, you know, a competitor's speaker here. That would be bad. You know, I'm like a real schmo. But um, it, it, it doesn't end up happening. You know, and and it's um, it, anyway. We do that a lot. We do those kinds of things and um, and check ourselves and make sure we're doing the right thing. But but it's you know that that's part of the business. That's part of the fun and part of the trepidation. But the art surround. So anyway, yeah, I got off on a tangent there. Sorry. The art surround is a really cool thing. So the art surround, if you have a speaker surround, you've all seen like a surround a speaker, right? It's a dome, kind of a curved piece of rubber typically. It can move farther one direction than it can the other direction. You can invert it and it'll go the opposite, but it, it moves further one way than the other, the typical surround. We came up with something where it's ribbed and much thinner and a much stronger, more elastic material the ribs just maintain the shape. But what happens with that art surround is not only can it move this far out, but it can move an equidistant back. So now all of a sudden, it's linear. It's not you know, going further one way than the other way. So all of a sudden, we've decreased the distortion that driver creates, everything else being the same, by half. We've reduced the distortion by half. Still, it's pretty low distortion to start with, but reduced it by half is quite a feat. The biggest thing, though, is we've increased the output by three decibels. 
three decibels is the same as adding another speaker of that same size. That's a huge thing. That's amazing. Or you would certainly have to have a whole lot more amplifier power, right? You would have to double the power, right? So you're going to have to have a lot more power to do that. And, and still, you know, it's not, gonna, it's not the way to do it. So dynamics, volume, contrast, all that goes up. That surround thing was a gigantic invention that we came up with a few years back. And um, yeah, it's made a big, big difference in our most recent series. And I know we also, another cool thing about the company is we have very expensive speakers down to pretty inexpensive speakers. These kind of things that we do tend to trickle down into the lesser series over time. We start always with, almost always, with our coolest technology or our newest thing and the most expensive stuff and then trickle it down. So, you do that on uh, all your drivers? That's around? Is it, right, is it just on the uh, low end or is it mid range? Also? Um, not many mid range drivers, but some of them. And some of them we use, like in the speakers in here, there's three drivers that look the same. Okay. The top is a base and mid range driver, okay. and so the bottom two are just mid range drivers. So, from the front, many of the parts they look the same. And in that case, yeah. On some we do it and some we don't do it. It just depends on the design. Mostly it's for lower frequency drivers. Or if it's a two-way speaker, then it's that mid-bass driver. So yeah, but, but not everything yet. And it's also, there are some things, like some less expensive things we make, like sound bars, for example. Things that we design, but we don't build. There's, we build about 66 to 67% of the products we make in the factory in Canada. But there's some less expensive products, sound bars and some of those kind of things that we don't build in Canada. But we don't do that in the, the export, the, the stuff we buy overseas. The problem is if we do it overseas and we show them how to make this and how to do it, it'll get copied and we don't do it. And so yeah, that, that's part of the restriction. We also, because we have this big factory, we're over time there was, there was a time probably six or seven years ago where the idea was maybe we should have more stuff built overseas. A lot of companies started doing that and we thought, yeah, you know, we don't want to lose the competitive advantage to doing that. And we figured out over time that it wasn't an, really an advantage for us. We have such a big factory and such a capability of doing stuff in that factory that over time it sort of shifted and we started moving more and more stuff back into our factory. So even some of the stuff that's built over there now, um, will the next series of it will make back in the factory in Canada. So. So this is a sneak peek here. This is just some, some stuff that we're um, going to have this year, new products that are coming this year. And we're you know, a pretty diverse company. We have a pretty wide range of products. So you'll see some stuff in here that you may have no interest in, and other stuff you may think, oh, that's really cool. But um, this will give you at least a bit of an idea of what we're up to. So Custom Cinema is just a working name inside the factory. But these are LCRs, or left, center, right speakers, that we're going to make that have integrated back boxes, and they'll flush into the wall. So there's a lot of times when people do theater systems that they don't want to see anything, or maybe a grill around a screen is OK, but freestanding speakers for some people um, just are not acceptable. So we take basically what we did there, and we're putting it into something that can be flushed in the wall. So there'll be six models, and the retail price on them will go from $800 to $3,500 a piece. This is one of the most expensive ones. Well, this is the most expensive model. And on the top three models, the whole front of this will be aluminum, so it's a very rigid, inert front um, that everything's mounted to. You can see sort of that ripply edge. Is that clear enough? around there, that's the arch surround. So you can even see it on that particular one that is essentially the mid-range there in your question, but a lot of times smaller mid-ranges won't have that. Same tweeter we use here, um, same uh, technology for reducing the edge diffraction there. So anyway, this is something that's pretty cool. Also bi and bi-wireable. 
and we even have an acoustic switch um, because some people um, want the speakers to be mounted behind the screen. So even the acoustically transparent screens aren't completely acoustically transparent. So it's just a switch that helps, gives us compensation for the high frequencies so that the screen doesn't knock that down. Um, I would say ideally if, if you can avoid that, avoid that um, and don't do that because there's a bit of a trade up in the picture and the sound. But some people are just adamant that you know the screen take up that whole wall and I don't want to see any speakers and so we want their money too. So. Um, outdoor speakers, so we'll have um, a series that we'll call Garden Oasis. There'll be speakers that look like landscape lights. So they can be <coughs> mounted on trees, they can mount on decks, they stick in the ground. There'll be um, speakers that, two different sizes here, uh, the satellites, that's kind of what it looks like from the top down. And two different subwoofers, and the subwoofers are buried in the ground, most of them, and you just see this part. So it fires up and that's what keeps the water from flowing into the port. So two subs, two satellites. These are either 8 ohm or 70 volts. So the 70 volt systems are cool for this kind of application because sometimes people have big outdoor areas and with a 70 volt system you can daisy chain from one speaker to another. So you can cover a big, huge area. And the advantage to doing something like this outdoors is that you, it's, it's sort of like having a lot of light, right? You could have one gigantic light in your backyard that would light up the whole backyard and be, you know, annoying to the neighbors. Or you can have a whole <coughs> bunch of smaller lights that more evenly distribute it in the yard and it doesn't annoy the neighbors. So with this, you can get much better coverage and great sound and not annoy the neighbors. Well, unless, you know, you wanted to. <coughs> so the next series. Of, of things to show you is um, uh, sound bars. So um, it's, you know, I'm sure all of you guys have gone to someone's house, right? And, you know, of all your friends, you're probably the guy in that group of friends that's the hi fi guy. And you go over to someone's house and they're having a party and they're playing the TV. And that's, if they have music on at all, they're playing the TV and you want to just like shoot yourself, you know? So I even have a pair of those. I have a, actually a pair of these I keep in the car, these little powered speakers we make. I keep them in the car because I have friends like that. And I'll like, dude, you know, how about I just pull these in and like hook it up to the phone and at least we'll have some music. And like, most of the time they're like, oh yeah, that'd be great. But anyway, a lot of people don't. So you can't really get any sound from really thin TVs. They're horrible. So sound bars are pretty popular. And the two sound bars we'll have in this series will have Anthem Room Correction. The more expensive one will have the DTS Play Fi, the wireless music system for around the house that works on your network. And it'll have HDMI switching. The other one won't. But here's the driver configuration. It actually has drivers that point off to the side that give you more of a bigger enveloping sound. Now, is it like a, a real surround system? No. But is it you know, nice for smaller rooms or bedrooms or exercise rooms or places where you want some decent sound or, you know, for some of your friends who have just, you know, the TV sound and you can be like, yeah, you know, it's not going to cost you a lot and then I won't mind being over at your house to watch the football game because I'll actually be able to hear what they're saying. Then this is our most exciting stuff, I'd say. This is called the Persona series. This is um, quite expensive. Products will be from 7,000 a pair to 35,000 a pair. Uh, we've had this in development for about five years, and we have prototypes of the biggest one that we've shown in Munich last year. There's the Munich show going on right as we speak, uh, the big <coughs> Hong Kong show, and at CES in Las Vegas. So we've shown this quite a bit. Um, the biggest one is a hybrid speaker. So hybrid meaning the base section is active, and the top section is driven by your amplifier. The cool thing about this, there's multiple cool things about this, but one of the really cool things is, and that's kind of how we came up with the name Persona. Persona is it takes on the personality of whatever comes into it. Whether it's the music, it's a good mirror image of that sound, of that person or that orchestra or whatever that is. It reflects that really well. But also of the amplifier. So if you're somebody who likes big, high-powered, solid-state amps, perfect, no problem but you're only driving this part. If you're somebody on the extreme <coughs> other end that has a seven watt on Ganku single-ended um, tube amp, no problem. 
sensitivity on this is 93 dB anechoic, so 96 dB in an actual room. So you can rock these things with just a simple amp. The grill in the back section here will make more sense in the cutaway. So it's a bit hard to, maybe I can increase it, yeah, look at that. So this is what the cutaway looks like. So there's four woofers, and they're what's called differential drive woofers. Each woofer <coughs> has two motor systems on it, so two voice coils in line, sort of like two locomotives on a freight train. Um, it's very linear and a lot of control moving back and forth. So these two fire out that grill material out the back. These two fire out the front. And internally, there's two 700 watt amps. So each pair has its own 700 watt amp. And we have anthem room correction for the bass section. So the area, as you go down lower in frequency, the more the room affects the sound. So that's where the more correction or help is needed. So this whole thing, um, the bass section is driven that way. The top section is a differential, an inverted differential drive woofer, uh, mid-range. So inverted differential drive mid-range. We've never done that before, but what it means is two neodymium magnets. We actually invented this, and this is another cool invention, that are out of phase with each other, or out of sync, out of polarity, right? So they're each pulling this way. So we've got an incredibly strong magnetic controlled um, motor here. And the cone material on, these are all aluminum drivers, but the cone material on the mid-range and tweeter are beryllium, beryllium, pure beryllium. We've done beryllium tweeters in the past. They're extremely expensive, but it's the ideal material. Really rigid, <coughs> really light, really strong, very high damping factor, very high resonant point. So it's the most neutral material we can find for a driver. The only reason we haven't done it for a mid-range is it's so expensive. So a seven inch mid-range driver, that cone at retail will cost just under a thousand dollars. The cone itself, only the cone. Really, really expensive stuff. Um, for us, we use pure beryllium, so it's stamped out of metal. It's not, you know, ground up beryllium that's glued onto like a plastic driver or something. It's pure beryllium metal. Um, and they're just incredible. They just get out of the way better than any speaker I've ever heard. That's our goal, and that's what we really, really achieved here. So pretty, uh, pretty great and pretty fun, and uh, we'll be, we have an event, a dealer event out in California for um, a, a group that we are part of that we'll be showing these off um, next week. So. Then there'll be several other models. So that one's, those are going to be 35,000 for the pair. The other models down, this will be around 25. Um, this doesn't have the active base section, so it's passive. Similar woofers, these two are the same. Then we go down and there'll be several other models. So one will be around 17, the one that we're not showing here, a little bit smaller, around 10K for the pair. And then there'll be a bookshelf speaker or a stand mounted, probably it'll be more often on a stand than really a bookshelf, but we call it that. And this is the only drivers in this are beryllium. So again, mid-bass driver and, and tweeter. What is, um, the, what is the frequency range on that? On this one? Yeah. Uh, the DIN number in a room is about 40 hertz, I think, where it's about 3 dB down. Um, I don't know for sure on this one, but I think that's about right on here. So it goes pretty low for a, for a small speaker. Um, there will also be a, a large center channel speaker for those people that want to do a theater system like this. So only paint finishes. You can see one of the finishes will be like a cobalt blue. We call it Audi blue. It's sort of like you guys' shirts back there, kind of. Um, and black, white, and a, a, a like almost a gunmetal or a charcoal gray color. So those will be the initial four colors, and then there'll be I'm sure some others as we go on. So for many of us, that's the most exciting stuff, even though you know we'll sell it in the smaller quantities than some of the other stuff. So this is new Anthem stuff that's coming. We haven't had um, Anthem two-channel products um, in a long time. And there'll be a new two-channel preamp and a new two-channel um, integrated amp. And I probably shouldn't call them two-channel. I'm trying to get back into the habit of calling them stereo because it's two-channel just sort of bothers me, but it's a habit. So stereo, stereo preamp, stereo integrated. These will be the first stereo products we've ever produced that have anthem room correction. 
So it'll have a digital front end if you want to use it that way. Certainly you can just come in analog and not do anything digital, but room correction has to be done digitally. So it'll have a simple phono stage. It'll have a digital front end where you can run um, USB in from your computer if you want to play files that way. Obviously you have an SP diff in. And, um, and then analog ins and an outs and subwoofer outs. So you'll be able to do you know, uh, base management too if you want to have subs. Similar kind of thing here where it's essentially the same preamp but with a power amp section in it. Um, so the integrated amp and the preamp will come out about the same time. This kind of gives you a, sort of an angled detail look. And there'll be additional amps and a matching amp for this series but probably not when we introduce this and this will probably, it's on target, it keeps staying on target so it looks like right around Thanksgiving. So not a good time to launch a product but that's one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Are they in the same factory as the speakers? Um, good question. So, some things are and some things aren't. These products and the receivers are not. Um, the power amps and the previous generation of processors, our most expensive processors, were. So we still make power amps there. We still make our own boards. We still have board stuffing, both um, surface mount and hole through. But um, yeah, these won't be made there. Uh, these will be the preamp will be three thousand dollars. The integrated amp probably five thousand dollars. So, uh, yeah, that's that was basically the decision there. We'll have these made by the same factory that makes the receivers. So they're a large company that does a lot of stuff. Very good on manufacturing, not you know good enough for us on on the engineering. But it's like a guy who can build a house or a guy who can design a house. Kind of different. So, anyway, that's kind of, uh, that's the rundown, that's, that's uh, pretty much what we had to show you. So any questions, any other questions? Speaker questions, hand questions, room correction questions. Do you have a favorite old Paradigm speaker, maybe that's not for this generation, but something in the past that's maybe not the best product? Uh, I mean, my favorite start. one that's not current is pretty recent. And that's the tributes that we had. So the tributes were pretty cool. They were basically studio cabinets with um, the front half of the drivers were from the signature series, and the back half of the drivers were from the studio series. So they were really a hybrid thing that we made just for a short time to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the company. Um, and yeah, it was it was kind of one of the things that um, it, it made a pretty good leap in performance from studio and it wasn't quite what signature was didn't quite have the, the oomph and the dynamics and um, but it was yeah pretty great um, you know it, it, we've had many versions of studio 100s and that's kind of a favorite of a whole lot of people because it was you know sort of like a like a mustang gt kind of thing it was just like so good a performance for the money and we've had multiple iterations of that um, so that that was pretty great also and then there were you know some other cool sort of standout things there were active speakers years ago that didn't sell very well um, like active speakers tend not to it's just tough to make a fully active speaker unless it's a fairly inexpensive speaker um, and companies have been trying to do it for years and years and years I mean there were active advents if you go back far enough and there were active century 100 JBLs if you go back far enough and, you know all the engineers always want to do the fully active thing. The trouble is you, you sort of force people to make an amp decision and a speaker decision at the same time, so it's tough in the market. A lot of times the guys that are going to buy that kind of thing already have an amp that they like and they don't want to change that. So, But yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell us the history. Anthem was associated in the past with Sonic Frontiers, now Paradigm. <coughs> uh, right. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't cover that. Um, so, I can't remember exactly the timeline, but Anthem started out, um, there was a company called Parts Connection that still is kind of around, I think. Um, I haven't looked for a long time, but they made kits and parts, and you could buy all kinds of different kits. You make your own preamp little phono stage. Certainly, if you were going to buy crossover components or caps or that sort of thing. And they started making some kits that um, then eventually 
people like the kits and said, yeah, this is great, but I don't want to go home and solder this thing up. Can you make this for me? And so they started making, pre-making what were kits into finished products. And they did pretty well. Then they got into um, primarily upper end tube gear. Um, and also they were pretty, um, pretty successful in, in the fairly early days of performance digital. So sort of around the time the Meridian MCD Pro came out and some of those, you know, early transports, there was a really successful early transport, early DAX, um, but it was primarily tube gear. And then back then, you really, you know, if you were a high-end company, it just wasn't cool to have surround stuff. So you kind of had to have it separate if you want to do that. So Sonic Frontiers was the name of the two-channel stuff, and the tube stuff, and the solid-state stuff was called Anthem. And the surround stuff was called Anthem. So that's where that kind of came, came about. Um, then eventually, um, well, kind of actually before the Anthem stuff. So it, the Anthem stuff started in development about the time the company got into trouble. And they sold a ton of stuff overseas and had pretty good successful in Asia especially. But um, in the 80s where there was the bad depression, um, problems in Asia with that market for them. And then here, they were going to go out of business. So Paradigm bought Sonic Frontiers and Anthem. So we still on the boxes. It says Sonic Frontiers because if you want to keep the name, you kind of got to keep using it. Like Ford had to do that with the Cobra name a long, long time ago. Um, but yeah, it, and then eventually, you know, when we did that, we didn't make any of the tube stuff then. And we started making more solid state stuff and concentrating more on the home theater market. And the two channel stuff just didn't exist anymore. So um, there's still, you know, especially in Asia, a call for the Sonic Frontier name. So there's still discussions whether we actually will bring back that name and make some stuff. It may or may not be tube stuff, but that's sort of, we, we always, I always, people always ask about stuff that's in the works and, and why do we do this instead of that. And we, because it's a business, we have to try to figure out what are the most important products to come. So like, for example, the two-channel products I showed here. When the engineers got done with this third generation of receivers, we started asking dealers, like, okay, we're at a crossroads for the, for the engineers. We can send them on one project or another, but we can't have them do two major projects at the same time. We have, up at Park, where they do most of this development work, we have 18 engineers, which is a fair number of engineers. It's not like a Denon or a Sony or something by any stretch of the imagination. But it's a pretty good amount, but we don't have enough where we can have two really major products because there's always some additional things like these sound bars and, and some of this other stuff going on. So by far, more people wanted the two-channel products than a more expensive processor. So it's likely we'll do a more expensive processor, surround processor, but we went with, you know, the what we call VOC or the voice of customers. We went with what people were saying, this is what I want from you guys more than that other thing. So, but that's that's sort of the, the I guess, the short history of Sonic Frontiers. Now, and on top of that, uh, when the market dropped in Asia, you know, then divorce and living high on the hog <laughs> bit them in the butt. I was a Sonic Frontiers rep. Oh, we were a dealer. Yeah. We, we dealt with Sonic Frontiers. It was pretty good. Just faded away, just like smoke in the wind. Well, they had the name well, the Anthem came on very strong after that. Yeah. After Sonic Frontiers drifted away and Paradigm got involved, mm -hmm. Anthem took off. And we've been an Anthem dealer since the beginning as well, thanks to Jerry over there. And he's our rep. So. Uh, yeah, we always have a bigger list than, than what we can make at any given time. And some things, things shift around on that list.